lesson today is a bit of a strange one in that there is not really a story in it. It is instead two short summary paragraphs, and if you look closely at your bulletin, you will notice that it comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. The verses 35 to 52, which come between there, contain Mark's telling of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus' walking on water. But for some reason, the lectionary chooses to leave that out this week, and instead we will hear those stories next week, but from the Gospel of John. So, weird little lectionary quirk. But despite the lack of a clear narrative, this morning's Gospel has some subtle and not-so-subtle teachings in it for us about Jesus, his ministry, and his call to us. So to set the scene, the disciples have returned from their mission trips. The ones we heard about a few weeks ago, where they were told to not take anything for their journey, where they were to depend upon the hospitality of strangers. They have been out casting out demons, healing, teaching, and they want to tell Jesus all about it. We can only imagine the stories they had the joys and sorrows they were holding, the successes and failures they encountered. They have been doing a new thing, flexing new spiritual muscles, adapting to change. I imagine them simultaneously energized, exhilarated, and exhausted. And Jesus sees them and says, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. What a beautiful line. Come and rest a while. My shoulders literally drop reading it. Jesus recognizes the state in which his disciples find themselves and says, in effect, you need to recharge. You need to sit for a bit. You need to tend to your souls. Slow down. Breathe. Take in what has happened to you. We might also note that this story comes on the heels of the story of the execution of John the Baptist. It is likely that Jesus, too, recognizes the need for them all to have some time to mourn together. Now, when I've read these verses in the past, I have wondered if the disciples and Jesus did, in fact, get any rest, because it feels as though as soon as they pull up on the shore, people have rushed ahead of them, and the crowds are once again pressing in on them. But a colleague this week suggested that perhaps the whole idea of getting in the boat and being in the boat was the deserted place where they could rest and be together. It's a compelling thought. Jesus and his disciples are often on the boat. And it made me think about the fact that many of our church's sanctuaries, if you look up, resemble and are built intentionally to be the hull of a boat, a place to find shelter, to rest, to be together with God. We use the word nave to describe this space, here, where we gather, and that comes from the Latin novice, meaning ship. So Jesus and the disciples, after spending some time together on the boat, pull up on shore, and indeed the crowds are there. My first reaction is, oh no, let them rest a little longer. But then comes another lovely verse. Jesus saw the great crowd, and he had compassion for them. Jesus sees the people, really sees them, and has compassion for them. Compassion is an interesting word. We may think of it as a synonym for pity, but it is actually very different. Pity is something you can feel without getting personally involved. And pity almost always carries with it a sense that the one receiving our pity is somehow less significant, less important than we are. We see ourselves as somehow removed 
from those that we see as pitiful. Not so with compassion. The Greek used in our gospel lesson is splachnizomai, which includes the root word for intestines. It translates to be moved as to one's bowels. Compassion is that gut-twisting moment when you feel another's pain and desire to do something about it. It is never just a passing emotion, but it is a full body experience that compels one to action. And it is a word we hear over and over again in the Gospels to describe Jesus' experience with the people and God's compassion for us. So why today does Jesus experience this gut-wrenching compassion for the crowds? We are told it was because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That is a poignant and powerful image, and indeed, perhaps many of us often feel like we are in that position. Shepherd is a common metaphor in the Bible, and kings were often referred to as shepherds in biblical times. Sometimes those terms were almost interchangeable, and as we see in our other lessons for today. Jeremiah, the lesson which Brant read for us today, is not concerned with actual shepherds in our first lesson, but rather is passing judgment on the kings who have not upheld their duties to their people, their flock. And the imagery would not have been lost on his ancient readers. Shepherds are supposed to take care of their sheep above all else. Feed them, protect them, guide them. The kings that Jeremiah denounces have done none of these things, and as a result, their people are scattered, exiled, suffering. Likewise, the people who are seeking out Jesus. Their shepherd, Herod Antipas, has just thrown a banquet for his officers and has killed the prophet who is telling of a new kingdom. Make no mistake, that this passage coming on the heels of the story of the beheading of John the Baptist is an indictment of Herod and all that his kingship stands for. The people seeking Jesus are looking for a shepherd who will lead them into God's kingdom. Now we might expect Jesus confronting these crowds to immediately begin healing or feeding them, but without looking back at the text, does anyone know what he does first? He began to teach them many things. Now, as someone who was a teacher before being called to the priesthood, I admittedly love this verse. And it is a remarkable way to think about ministry, about spreading God's kingdom. And perhaps it has a call for us today. We certainly don't have to look very far to see people who are like sheep without a shepherd. We don't have to look very far to find people who need healing, people who need raising up. We don't have to look very far to find forces at work in our world spreading division and hate. And as 21st century disciples of Jesus, we stand in the place of knowing that the compassion that Jesus felt and the teaching words he spoke are for us and for our world, just as much as for the crowds he saw in front of them. He knew that when he sent out the apostles, that he was sending them out into a world in which not all would receive the message, and into a world that would cause havoc to the systems. But he knew also that the cure for brokenness lies in resting together in God, in learning, in teaching, in loving, and in going out. Jesus refuses to lead with the time-honored tools of domination, intimidation, or fear. Instead, he sees those who are in front of him, teaches them with love, and then provides healing and feeding with dignity. He acts as the shepherd we heard in our beloved 23rd Psalm today, 
guiding, leading, accompanying. I don't know where you find yourselves in the scriptures this morning. Are you a disciple who is feeling equally energized and exhausted? Are you, are you in need of rest? Are you part of the crowd, feeling like a sheep without a shepherd? Is gut-wrenching compassion moving you to be present in our world and act in some way? Are you walking through a valley? Are you feasting at a table? Wherever it is you find yourself today, know that it is okay. Rest, eat, drink, heal, move, knowing that you are loved and cherished and shepherded, shepherded by a compassionate, loving shepherd God. In the name of the one who loves us, and brought us into life. Amen.